Hello, hello, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us once again to a new AFSIA webinar in collaboration with Startup Energy. Um, very happy to welcome you once again. Um, this is, I believe, the fourth or, or the fifth uh, webinar in this series. And uh, this webinar today is more exciting than ever. Um, we will be talking about entrepreneurs who are not only doing things for Africa, but also making things in Africa with a real eye on um, providing solutions that are adapted to our reality here on the continent. Um, and I want to share with you just in these first few moments a, a quick overview of uh, our speakers today. Um, see, we will have uh, Gareth, we will have Arnaud, Nora, Lyord, and Romain who will be uh, telling us about all the great things they do. Gareth will be our moderator today, so I don't want to reveal too much about our speaker. He will introduce them to, to you uh, later. But what I would like to do is to tell you just a few little things about how to get the most out of today's session. Uh, very quick housekeeping items. Um, first of all, yes, of course, you will be sent the full presentation decks of each one of our speakers, and you will also get a link to the recording of the session. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're not able to stay with us the entire session, uh, fear not, you will receive all the information later on, and you will be able to, to follow up individually with the speakers. Um, and then also for interaction during the session today, um, at the bottom of your screen in the, in the Zoom buttons, uh, you have a few important buttons there. You have the chat button. This uh, chat function is in case you want to say hi to the other listeners and uh, just exchange a few thoughts and uh, uh, launch some discussion topics. Um, but if you have some specific questions for our speakers and our moderator, then I warmly invite you to do so through the Q&A option, uh, because there all these questions are recorded and uh, cleaned up and uh, kept ready for Gareth to be able to address as many as, uh, as, many as possible of these questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So please use the Q&A section. And this is it for me, because I want to already hand over to Gareth. Uh, I'm super, super happy to welcome you, Gareth. Uh, this is the first time that we are uh, doing something together. And uh, this is through a, a, a very dear topic of mine through this uh, webinar today. Um, and to be honest, I, I love when we have people with multiple likes. Um, I, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it reveals a little bit of the personality of people. And uh, Gareth, for those of you who don't know him, um, is in charge of sales and marketing at a company, Microcare, um, in South Africa. And um, he's, he's a professional in many different things, uh, in sales and marketing, uh, but also in, in journalism and uh, radio presenting. Um, He's the, he's the owner of the company GP Synergy, uh, which is a marketing and media business specializing again in the, in the energy sector, but also in community and sports. Um, and on top of this, I believe you've also had a previous life as a pastor, <laughs> if my information is correct. So really a, an amazing background, uh, an amazing personality. And this is it for me, Gareth. I hand over to you and uh, thank you again for accepting the invitation. Mm. Thank you, everyone, and it's a, a wonderful greeting all the way from South Africa, um, all the way down in the south in a, a town that used to be called Port Elizabeth. Um, we refer to it as Nelson Mandela Bay, and um, more recently, it's got a more um, a local name called Kabecha. Kabecha is the name of the city where I'm coming from, so wonderful to have you with us. And I'm looking forward to sharing our story here, uh, what we do down in Nelson Mandela Bay, and of course, hearing from our guests as well. Um, I'm going to share the screen now with you um, in a moment uh, with my presentation. I'm actually the first speaker just to tell you a little bit about our story. So, John, if you could just 
share the screen there for us. And uh, yeah, we will then uh, go ahead. So Microcare, we're a, a local manufacturer in South Africa. And we've had the privilege of manufacturing, and this is amazing, since 1990. I don't know where you were in 1990, but solar certainly wasn't something considered back in 1990. In fact, in South Africa, it was only later on when load shedding and power cuts really came in in the late 2015 that we really started to see solar booming. But we've been involved with solar manufacturing in South Africa since 1990. So wonderful story to tell. Now, this slide shows you just a, a full range of products that we manufacture. And I wanna very briefly touch on all of them, but our story is not complete without the 74 people that make up our company from locals, the students who've gone through studies to those who came from jobless backgrounds and we've trained them through the years. Our story is a one of hope of job creation and skills development. So 74 people on the staff, including myself, who are part of this incredible story. And we manufacture the electronics. People always get excited by solar saying, oh, do you make panels? Do you make batteries? No, we, we don't do that. We do these clever things that you see here, the electronics the enabling of taking power from the sun and converting it into usable power for battery storage and for direct use. So we can see some images of the products that we manufacture um, and installed into a system. And, and our systems are integrated for the, the usage of solar geysers, a, a big part of energy saving today in Africa, solar pumping, water is, is uh, becoming a scarce commodity in, in Africa. And so we're able to draw on the sun to find that water and then, of course, integrating it into a battery storage system. And all of that data, then, we can supply onto on online log living in. We want access to the information. So at MicroCare, we design, develop, and write the software that gives us this kind of data that shows the sun generation, the solar input, how much money I'm spending on, um, on my utilities. And so we give an all-in-one site management system from your small business to your large farmer to your big business. And this is what we've been doing since 1990, providing solutions to create energy sustainability, independence, and also mitigating against the incredible rising costs of energy in South Africa. Here's an example of a, a farmer who needed to pump some water out of the ground. And so there in the orange box is our controller with standard solar panels, and we are pumping water to be able to irrigate his farm. One of our new exciting developments has been taking our technology, our inverters, our solar chargers, our pumps, and we've been installing them in these containers. You can see in this image here, a containerized 45 kilowatt mini grid system. Uh, we designed all the components that go into that container. I'll show you in a moment. There's the panels that the, the installer has set up and it's literally creating a power station in any location, 45 kilowatt um, of peak power available. On the solar side, we're making around 23 kilowatt hours per hour rather. And on the battery storage, we've got about 60 kilowatt hours of storage. Yeah, now we dive into the container and we can see our modulized, uh, customized uh, solution. On the back wall, I can see the solar chargers coming in there. So those 160 panels that we see out in the field get connected into these dedicated high voltage solar chargers. On the right hand side, we've got a, a copper buzz bar running behind a bank of inverters. And on the left hand side, a locally packed battery called Blue Nova into a casing providing a one stop shop solution for this solution. Yeah. One of the newer industries that's uh, really growing and booming, not only in South Africa, but around the continent is, is solar geysers. The, the old conventional solar geysers would have pumped water onto the roof and rotated it into a hot water storage facility. We've five years ago come up with a, a new technology that uses direct solar panels. And we've got a little controller there. You see MicroCare geyser controller that actually in a clever way, inverts that DC power directly then onto the geyser. So we're providing direct DC power onto an AC element to provide the solar power. A very efficient solution. It does have backup power coming through from your utility, from your power supplier, and a, a brand new solution, which we've been rolling out over the last two years. So we manufacture the controller, we design and develop it in-house. And of course, we cannot ignore the electric vehicle space that we are moving into. It has one of our electric cars that we've got inside the factory. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see South Africa and possibly Africa's first 
50 kilowatt EV DC charger that we designed and developed three years ago. It was our second prototype and uh, we use it at our factory to showcase the technology that we have already designed and developed using technology starting from 1990, developed, integrated, and now this is our second generation. We're currently moving on to our third generation electric vehicle charger. Because we're a factory, because we're manufacturing, you can see in this image here on the left-hand side, the equipment on the left there, one of my technicians training installers. So because we are local, we are able to empower and equip installers from around the continent. They come, we host them at the factory, and we teach them how to, do, to use our equipment and to understand how to use solar power. So that is Microcare, manufacturers of solar equipment. We manufacture inverters, solar chargers, solar pumping, the geysers, the mini grid, and of course then the electric vehicle chargers. Just a, a final comment from me from Microcare side, uh, as a local manufacturer, of course, it's been an incredibly challenging time um, in the space of, of manufacturing with the current shortage that we have around the world of components. Uh, we certainly have felt it. But the good news is that we've been able to pioneer over the last uh, 32 years of manufacturing that we are very reliant on local manufacturers as well to assist us. So currently, Microcare is products are made up of 93% African components, which I think is a wonderful success story. And uh, we're able to manufacture those 50 plus products from our factory in Nelson Mandela Bay in South Africa. So there we go. That's a little bit about our story uh, from Microcare Energy, Microcare Solar uh, here in South Africa. So there we go. We've opened up now meeting our wonderful uh, speakers. I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker, which is Lord Mwaniki. He's the COO and product develop lead in Kenya. He's the co-founder of Zuri Solutions. He works as the project and trade officer at the Sector Alliance at Kepsa. He's been inspired by other businesses. He's an entrepreneur at heart. And of course, a man who loves to study. Always trust a man who likes to learn and study. He's got a master's in business administration as well. Lord, it's wonderful to have you all the way from Kenya joining us. We're going to hand over to you now. And thank you for your time. What, what an introduction. Thank you, Gareth. Um, I'll jump straight into sharing my presentation. And hello, everyone, from wherever you're joining from. My name is Leod Moneki, as Gareth has introduced me. I am the co-founder of Zura Solutions. Uh, Zura Solutions is a startup based here in Nairobi, Kenya. We, and, and Zuhura is actually a Swahili word, um, meaning uh, which loosely translates uh, to, to, to the brightest star in, in the galaxy. And we, we tend to say that we, we bring in um, light to the street food sector, because what we have developed here, as you will see on the screen, is a solar powered vending trolley. For those who've been to Kenya, you might have noticed, uh, or you might have seen a lot of street food vendors pushing a cart uh, that sells uh, street food. So it's very popular. Every round the corner, you'll see it. So we've we've taken that um, trolley. We have redesigned it to run on renewable energy. So it runs basically on solar energy. And vendors can actually use this product for up to 14 hours a day to keep their food warm. And they can charge mobile phones. And the, the product, as you can see on the screen, it's very easy to push around and like what's available on the market currently. So we're excited about our journey here. Our flagship product is called the Halisi Trolley. Uh, it's a very innovative product, as you, you can see and as I have explained. We are now actually working on, a, on another model as, as well that we can cook, not just keep the food warm. So we are a team of five. Currently, we have two engineers working with us, myself in product development, and we have our CEO uh, as well, and we have an electrical uh, assistant who has also been supporting us for the last uh, one and a half years. So it's an exciting journey for us. I thought because this is a, on, on, on Made in Africa, because our product is actually developed at, um, at a lab here in Nairobi. Uh, just to share a brief overview of what the manufacturing sector is like in Kenya. And um, we, we, we've seen the sector growing over the last couple of years. And uh, companies like ourselves, especially startups coming onto the space, are really finding um, a budding sector, we would say. Uh, it contributes to about eight to 10% of the GDP. 
uh, we've seen a lot of innovate or, or rather we've seen a lot of uh, work by some government agencies and private sector bodies trying to push the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya narrative, which has been a big challenge for innovators and manufacturers to find, um, to sell locally as people would prefer sometimes um, goods from abroad, sometimes that are cheaper or that are perceived to be better in other times. So also we have seen uh, a bit of available skilled workforce in this space. We've seen a lot of uh, young people coming from TVETs joining the manufacturing space, which has been really helpful and uh, to us, to this sector. Um, also the transport and logistics network has been improving right here in Kenya, which has been an enabler for this sector. Uh, we have also seen from various organizations like the Kenya Association of Manufacturers the push towards favorable policies uh, through advocacy. So that has really worked out, worked well for manufacturing sector. Although a lot more remains to be done. As you can see the challenges, of course, still outweigh some of the strengths that I've highlighted. Um, we have seen the high cost of industrial inputs and raw materials is very high here in Kenya. So um, these are some of the challenges we have experienced. And I'll be running you through some of those in my next slide. Um, in some instances, we have double taxation, which really inhibits uh, manufacturing sector. Also the cost of transport and logistics, even as our roads and the rail network improve, uh, the cost of moving goods or moving some of these produce, even things that we manufacture from one area to the next, remains very high. Also access to finance, um, access to quality and affordable, reliable uh, and, and reliable raw materials, it's, it's even energy, it's, it's very expensive to access, for example, steel, which is one of our major raw materials in building the, the cuts, as you can actually see on the picture on the, on the left. Just to run you through the next one, sorry, sorry about that. So this, this has been our journey. So in 2019, when we began Zufra Solutions, we, we began with just an idea and we were thinking, so at the time, were just two of us, it was myself and my colleague, Benson. Um, so, so then we thought, how do we find a local manufacturer to help us prototype this, this wonderful idea that we had? Uh, because ideally when you're building hardware, it's a bit difficult to put together pieces, even sometimes in your own space, unless you do it very small. In, uh, uh, so we, we looked around, it was very difficult finding the right partner, even for prototyping. Uh, fortunately, we found a partner who was uh, a design lab here in Nairobi. We worked with them for, almost a year trying to perfect what we had thought about. And they were very, we were very fortunate because they hooked us up to some wonderful engineers whom we worked with. And one of them now is actually part of our team, a full-time team. Uh, they, they eventually joined us, which has been wonderful. So it's, it's, it was a very difficult journey in finding that manufacturing partner. Then we moved to now product and design, now in development. Then we hit a snug again with the financing bit. Uh, it becomes very expensive when, when you're building hardware, unlike software. Sometimes um, sourcing the materials and finding the right partners, it's, it's quite a journey, it's quite an expensive process. Uh, we are bootstrapping. So again, we are putting our resources together. We all had uh, our day jobs. So at the end of the month, you pull in a bit of resources, then get to the next level. So fortunately, we were able to begin some stress tests on the market with the product we had built at the time. And uh, we are able to pick a lot of feedback from our vendors who are, we're working with. Then now we have now moved to production. Um, after testing, we have iterated the product and now we are moving into production. That's one of the products you've seen on the first slide there. So here again, difficulty finding raw materials, they're very expensive. So one week, the price of steel is this much, then the next week it changes. So it also makes it a bit difficult to come up with a fair price point if um, the market sometimes is that volatile or the cost of raw materials is that changes that uh, often. Also finding, again, a good manufacturing partner. We were moving from a design lab to now manufacturing. Finding a good manufacturing partner in Kenya, we would speak to some of them, they say, the volumes are not high enough um, for us to work with you. We would need to do this. So the challenge was, was there. But fortunately, we found uh, one of our, our partners now who was also just starting out, they were building very good product and they were able to give us a good deal. So we worked with them and now we are based at, at their lab. That's where we actually develop from. That's where we, we, we produce our product from. So it's been really that kind of exciting journey. So what, what, what are the opportunities for us? We see um, the opportunity for manufacturers, not just in Kenya, but in Africa to create 
products that are competitive in terms of price and quality. There's that opportunity. We also see an opportunity for us to invest in modern technology. So I'll be able to produce finer products, especially hardware products. Then also build um, products and technologies that are actually for Africa, that we really, that Africans can resonate with and that address the needs of African community or Kenyan community in this uh, case for our product. In terms of trade, we see a lot of opportunity for us to branch out, not just here in Kenya, but in the region and Africa, enabled by, by the AFCFTA, for example, will be the biggest uh, trading block. So we see the, such kind of opportunity. We see an opportunity of also in policy for us to work with policymakers and, and, and businesses to create policies that encourage local manufacturing and production, also tax incentives, especially to startups like ourselves. Um, because startups and entrepreneurs are able to create um, opportunities for work for young people and, and spurred economic development. Also an opportunity for financing. Um, we believe that the public and private um, sector can work together or can find ways to unlock financial resources to support innovators and encourage local manufacturing. So that's a bit of the opportunity that we see here. Um, so on, on our, on our, we feel as Zavura Solutions, we are very much open to both and local, local and international partnerships to raise capital, to work together with us, to see that we, we bring the product, the Halisi trolley to everyone in the continent and, and to also support um, street food vendors who have all over Africa. I think all of us can recognize that we see street food vendors all over Africa. Thank you very much. That's um, my presentation for now. I know there was not much time. I had my seven minutes. Thank you very much, Karel. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. And um, of course, if anyone's want to engage with Lord afterwards, uh, we will have a Q and A session in a in a few moments. But we will uh, continue. Thank you, Lord, to meet and to hear from our next uh, speaker. Um, and it is Nora Maguero, who is the founder of Drop Access. Always love to meet fellow mechanical engineers and renewable energy experts and uh, spent the last seven years innovating and finding solutions for rural communities. So again, we're hearing from entrepreneurs, people who are dreamers, who are wanting to seek, find solutions. And she took the project lead at the Vaxi Box, which we're gonna hear a little bit about now as well. She's got some several awards under her belt and uh, looking forward to hearing a bit about the, the Micro Grid Academy Award winner as well. She's uh, been the African Queen of Energy Awards. So this is a, a lady who's um, certainly achieved a lot and we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about uh, Drop Access. So, Nora, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, let me just share my screen briefly. Yeah. Let me put it on uh, presentation mode. So, thanks so much, Gareth. Uh, that coming from me and also knowing how much experience you have in this space it's such an honor uh and it's such a pleasure also to to learn so much from you i'm also really really glad that i came after lloyd because his experience working with zuhura solution is exactly replicated or literally superimposed on my experience um leading drop access and building the vaccine box solution so just going straight into it my name is nora maguero i'm one of the co-founders and ceo of drop access and drop access is um the owner of vaccine box and as you can see, Vaxibox is bridging the cold chain gap in healthcare. And uh, I'm glad that even as we're having this conversation today, we've advanced even beyond uh, healthcare to just the SME and the farmer space to try to equally bridge the cold chain gap in these areas. So um, when we built Vaxibox, really, we we're trying to target uh, the, the issues that are always faced within the lower level healthcare uh, institutions are that is the level three and the belows, the blood banks, the delivery centers in rural communities. And I've lived in a rural community and I even work right now in a rural community for the past uh, over five years. I've worked in this community for over seven years and in various communities in Kenya. And I've witnessed firsthand the losses, economic losses, um, uh, healthcare material losses like drug and vaccines. I've witnessed the disease burden that really is predominant in these communities and mostly affiliated with the lack of energy access that eventually now affects the gaps in the cold chain. And these cold chain, cold chain gaps are, in C, are experienced in situ at the facility, but then also because these communities do tend to do um, 
a lot of field activities since accessibility to this healthcare is still, uh, the chains are still broken. So you find that even when they're out there with their logistical networks and all the work that they're doing, they equally face cold chain challenges. And you find because of such issues now, we have still such pending healthcare needs within the African continent and Kenya is just one of them. And I, and I, I actually, I'm, I'm proud of the strength that Kenya has made in energy access that eventually is translated to to healthcare, but then you look at the rest of the continent, there's still really hot spots that uh, daily need uh, efficient coaching and even sustainable and just available coaching. So now Vaxibox is, has been ideally designed to be able to address the last mile logistical and in-situ coaching needs of the lower level healthcare facility. It's a portable a solar refrigerator that is locally made in Kenya. And uh, the beauty about it is the fact that it's so versatile and portable that it fits uh, perfectly within uh, or onto the available logistical means like the bicycle, the motorbikes, the donkeys, the, car the carts and the trolleys. And mostly because we saw the burdens that these communities face, as much as they already, the larger tire healthcare facilities, they're called the level four and the level five. When you look at the level three that serves the greater need, they do a lot of logistical works and there's always broken cold chain between there. So Vaxibox was designed to be able to meet those needs. Somebody fearing vaccines from the high facility from collection during the month, for them to use the whole month. So we want to meet their needs as they carry them on the motorbike or on their bicycle or as they do the field vaccination. And uh, uh, also something that guided the development of Vaxibox is the fact that it has digital real-time data monitoring, something that came out quite exciting for us. We didn't really design uh, this with Vaxibox. Like this was, a, we didn't sit down and say, hey, we're going to do this fridge and it's going to have data, real-time data monitoring. When we rolled out the first prototype in, uh, the first locally made prototype in 2021, uh, and we had like staggering success seeing how we're trying to help communities and saving the waste, the, the vaccine uh, from being wasted. And like, even other drugs like the oxytocin that they like, they will tell us point blank, like, hey, I'll actually like to monitor the temperature on this fridge using my phone, or I like to know remotely instead of always coming to log each hour. And that really formed now the IoT solution that Vaxibox is embedded with and also has become our uh, our, our, our such a great value proposition for Vaxbox because when you look at refrigeration, it's not something new. It's been done over the years. It was invented a long, long time ago. But then portable smart refrigerator is how we're trying to put our niche within uh, this, uh, the, within this space, uh, the, the cold chain space as well as the clean tech space. And obviously, we've incorporated it with solar power and battery backup because still uh, there are so many communities that still lack that access to power. And even the communities in Kenya that we test out with that are connected to the grid, you find that almost half part of the year, they do still don't have electricity. Hence, that's why you find that Vaxibox is solar powered and comes with battery backup just to increase the autonomy, the holding time for this refrigerator as much as possible. And um, what I've seen Vaxibox doing for communities, and it, came, it started out as an idea so simple, uh, like, hey, let's try and see if we can try to fix uh, the cold chain gaps in these certain healthcare communities. And we've seen how it has been adopted by even communities far and beyond. And we're all constantly getting reviews and orders and people wishing to have Vaxibox in their facilities and even storing other things that you didn't really intend to has been so impressive and just taught me the potential of what manufacturing and production of clean tech can do for the continent. And if you put the engineering aside, and I know my team is largely engineer base and we always get excited with de designing and manufacturing. I've also seen how uh, manufacturing Vaxibox has revolutionized uh, the rural communities that work with and you see them now starting to form micro economies like you find the places where um, uh, they're, they're conducting field vaccinations, women come there to sell foods and you know that's how economies also grow and uh, Vaxibox is locally made in Kenya uh, the process that we follow right now is pretty much similar to what Zuhura had explained, looking for a production partner and also having their own design or looking for an expert to do the design. But then um, we've not really been lucky to get a production partner that has been able to snatch, snap it out from our fingers and say, I'm going to make it for the same reasons where the thing is they, they, we don't have the, 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 the numbers, or rather the quantities for, to, make them, to make it worthwhile for them to 
form their own production capacity or the production line for Vaxibox. So we end up working with various contracted workshops in Kenya and in rural parts of Kenya that can help us very to repair and maintenance, but, but then also manufacture of various small components. And I've seen how this process has ended up employing young people and even creating greater skills within this specific workshop. So we literally train people, this is how you bend stainless steel. This is the angle of bend when you're using like healthcare facilities, then you find uh, that skill being replicated into other things you can produce final products and that knowledge and technology transfer has been so impressive that just has has just made us really stick to us manufacturing vaccine box locally within kenya there has um okay so before even i go to the challenges vaccine box has been able to be used by at least nine communities when this pitch was done it was at nine communities now we are at 11 communities we've saved over 3,000 vaccines from being wasted We've affected, we've actually impacted over 3,000 children uh, by helping them get vaccinated. We've created economic saving for these facilities that did not have um, uh, a cold, ch cold chain or even some were actually using petrol and diesel power uh, engines to drive the refrigeration. And when they discovered that aware and picked up vaccine, but they, they've experienced economic savings. Obviously, generally, there is the CO2 savings that come with using solar and battery backup. And well, uh, just like I mentioned earlier on, we've been able to create over 50 direct and indirect jobs within just this sector alone. And we foresee that like, even once we develop our own uh, elaborate manufacturing and assembly workshop in Kenya, we even create more jobs, not just directly with us, but also indirectly by other, forming other economies around manufacturing, but then also supply of goods and the likes. So um, just to go back to again to the challenges that has come up with trying to manufacture vaccine box within Kenya is first of all for us we really face such a big challenge with the de-adoption because when we first told people that hey we have a fridge that has been manufactured locally in Kenya they couldn't really believe it because the question they'll ask like is it going to explode or will it actually keep things cold and um, it had to take a bit of time for them to work with them and even teach them and train them how to use the vaccine box and even how to charge it, how to put the solar panels out there and even do basic maintenance. And we realized that idea adoption really is hindering the uh, adoption of even other clean tech technologies. So it's also a process for us to be able to say that uh, uh, renewable energy coverage can actually get to a certain level. Then also we had issues with technical capacity. Uh, there wasn't really anybody who came, who came out and said, hey, I've ever manufactured but fridges locally here in Kenya, so I'm going to partner with you. This is something we had to learn from scratch. Funny enough, refrigeration is not something new. It's been done over and over again. But when you come to building a portable refrigerator that still has to perform even at, at an angle of tilt at 45 degrees and also has to be able to perform even while it's in motion and also while it's out at field, but then also give the, a good performance for in-situ placement. That was now where the innovation and the, the technicality came about. But um, And we had to learn so much by doing so much research and even consulting, not just locally here in Kenya, but also abroad, because there wasn't really a really uh, technical, built technical capacity within Kenya that could actually take us in and help us manufacture this refrigerator. And I'm pretty sure this is a, a common challenge across the board within the continent. Maybe Gareth and uh, Lloyd can actually share a bit of light about that. But then also the issue of finance, because we've realized that these health technologies are mostly imported into the country, the development organizations that do finance them. So it's not so easy for uh, an investor to come and say, I'm going to put money in this, because also how their finance is a bit tricky. Governments are the ones who buy uh, healthcare products. Governments take a very long time to pay, so people don't want to put their investment in that, because the payback, payback obviously is going to take quite a bit of time. Then we face the issue of tax and double taxation within Kenya, not just, um, so what happened in Kenya, like each time there is a, a new regime, government regime, the tax policies change. So you find like this time around, they scrapped out the tax, the next time they're going to bring it, they're going to bring it back, or even they tax other items. And that has really even afflicted us from the word go, because then we find ourselves like incurring so much tax and money because of all these and unregulated taxation, unregulated issues within the taxation policy. And also we've faced issues with regulation. Funny enough, a few a few months ago, we actually had a very bad running with um, the Minister of Health and uh, who had actually uh, acting under the authority of WHO because uh, Vaxibox is a medical refrigerator that is regulated eventually by WHO. So we came to realize later that there is already the top regulation that governs the world and all the countries that are there to WHO that we had to adhere to. And us being a very small organization, we didn't really know all the regulation. But then it just exposed us to the technicalities of trying to bring 
a locally manufactured technology within the continent and then ensuring that it can be adopted and used as a globally accepted technology. There are already bodies that govern that and it takes so much understanding and conversation to be able to actually ensure that we do adhere to the regulation. So yes. um, uh, no, luckily no, right no. now, no really yes. left to finish off for us there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to wrap it up and say I'm so proud to be living to be leading a team of uh, very brilliant engineers and uh, mentors in this space. Uh, and uh, like I, I know even at this moment, we still need to have more expertise coming in on board. So we're always looking out for who can actually join up, join us to just build Vaxibox with the best technology as much as we can. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Nora. We um... We can only applaud you for uh, incredible work that you are doing on the front line of Africa. So well done, really amazing. Um, I know it Thank is you. very hard for our speakers because we are so passionate about our industries to, to try and do it in seven minutes. We have so much to tell you and that's why we'll have a Q&A session. And of course, you're able then to engage with our speakers after our session. So we're going to move on uh, to our next speaker and uh, wonderful to have with us Arne. Um, he is from La Gazelle, uh, 20 years plus experience in renewable energy sector, which is amazing. You think about 20 years in this industry and we've got some amazing people with the experience to take us forward, specializing in electrical infrastructure from residential, industrial and commercial development. Uh, together with a partner there, they've combined their expertise and they've created this company. And uh, we can't wait to hear Arno, a little bit more about what you're doing at La Gazelle. So over to you. Thank you. Hi everybody, so uh, let me share my uh, presentation. So, is it okay, I'm going to start. So I'm uh, Arno, the head of Flagazel. Uh, I'm going to try to present a project, but uh, with my poor English, so sorry. Uh, La Gazelle is born uh, from the experience of two companies, a family-owned company named uh, Shaban, specialized in uh, transforming uh, metal wire and uh, sheet of metal, uh, with uh, 60 years of, uh, more than 60 years experience. It's my grandfather that launched the company. And uh, another company, CB Energy, uh, Burkina Bay, uh, company that I uh, founded uh, 15 years ago uh, in a little city of uh, Burkina Faso named Dedugu. Uh, it is one of the pioneer uh, local company in uh, solar energy. Uh, La Gazelle uh, was founded in, uh, in uh, 2050 uh, when uh, Maxence, my brother, take the head of the uh, uh, French company Chaban, and we decided to uh, combine our experience to create La Gazelle as to uh, uh, promote and uh, industrialize solar products in Africa. So with La Gazelle, we design a, a, a little range of Pico solar product to begin. Uh, two models of Pico Solar models. Aqua components are imported mainly from France, but uh, for some from uh, China. But our products are manufacturing in Africa. It is not only assembling. We do uh, electronic uh, solder. We do metal uh, transforming, and uh, we respect all the uh, international uh, rules in terms of quality in each of our uh, local uh, manufacturing. So for the first workshop was in Dedugu, Burkina Faso, because I spent uh, a lot of time in Burkina Faso, but we also open uh, a new one in uh, Benin last year, and uh, another one with uh, a partner in uh, Thiès, Senegal this year. Uh, we produce more than uh, 100 uh, products uh, from the beginning, and uh, today uh, 
we are on the way to enlarge our range of products. Uh, we also have a SHS in uh, our range of products. We use uh, some uh, partner uh, electronic boards to do this product. Uh, we also designed some uh, charging, collective charging station. Uh, it is a, a needs uh, that we we have uh, we have designed this product because the needs is on the the local uh, ec the local contents uh, put us. So we designed this product. And uh, we also have some appliance uh, like bulbs or battery pack. But uh, as uh, Shaban is uh, uh, subcontracting for a lot of uh, uh, domains in industry, uh, we want to turn La Gazelle in uh, an industrial uh, subcontracting. Uh, the two uh, presenters. Uh, speaker before me uh, uh, explained that it is not uh, easy to find somebody to make the products in Africa and uh, us we think we have uh, the experience to uh, co-design and uh, uh, help other company other, uh, or distributor that want to to stop uh, importing product to help us to uh, design products with uh, international quality standards, easy to make locally and uh, uh, at the good price for the market. So uh, for us, the main challenge is, uh, is uh, the same that uh, the other project, I think, but uh, we have a, a lot of difficulties uh, in the last month with the security in uh, sub-Saharan countries that is very difficult for local uh, employees because in Burkina Faso uh, for the moment our, our factory is very near from the red zone. We also have a lot of difficulties with the rules, the the, the bordel on the market, if I can uh, explain my, myself as this, because uh, a lot of uh, uncertified product and very bad quality product are on the market, and there is no rules to uh, transport and to export our product from, uh, from our local uh, uh, workshops. So uh, on the beginning, we think that with uh, one workshop in, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso, for example, we can also export to Mali, Niger, Benin, or, but uh, without the rules, the good rules, it's not possible. We have a lot of risk and a lot of uh, expensive costs. So uh, thank you everybody. Don't hesitate to uh, uh, take uh, contact with us. We are very happy to help to Industrial Africa. Uh, as a result, we can say that uh, La Gazelle trained a lot of uh, local uh, employees and uh, create uh, some job. But uh, also, uh, we love at La Gazelle uh, do some partnership with uh, a lot of uh, different uh, uh, Institute to promote the industrialization of the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Arne. Thank you very much for an insightful talk. Uh, we have lots of comments and questions and requests, um, which I think is what this event and this webinar is all about. So thank you for those comments. We will certainly create and facilitate opportunity for that. So we will come back to our speakers with some questions but first, we'd like to introduce our final speaker, and uh, this is Romain. He is uh, involved in renewables now for six plus years, a very fit man this morning. We heard when we were preparing, he was running around the city looking for internet. So it's wonderful to have him with us here. 
um, an engineer who's passionate about hybrid solar systems. He's got a post-master's degree in international energy management uh, from uh, Minister Paris. And uh, Romain, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Gareth, and thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon, Africa and beyond, I believe. <clears throat> I saw a few more people from other countries in Africa. Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me present my screen, my turn. Am I sharing there, Gareth? Uh, not not yet. It's there. No, we've we've lost it there. Sorry, not sure why I cannot have access to my own screen. You can right, do a little ahead. refresh of your screen and then click on slideshow as you were trying to do before. I refresh the screen. Thank you. Sorry very much to lose this precious time that we. We all have. Well, just I'll just use the opportunity just to remind those listening in as you try and get connected there, Romain, that we will, when Romain is finished, um, take some, and thank you for all your questions that have come in. We will take some- I will share your present presentation, there. Romain. Sorry to interrupt you, Gareth. There it is. And you just need to guide me, okay? Thank you, thank you for that. Indeed, I had to refresh, but I'm gonna take yours. Let's jump right into that. Um, Hello, everyone again. Uh, my name is Roma. I'm the head of energy and charging at Rome, um, also called uh, head of everything that has no wheels uh, at Rome, which is an electric mobility company uh, based in uh, Kenya. Nairobi uh, is headquarter. Uh, please, next, uh, next one. So we are Rome. We were previously Opibus, so perhaps some of you know us as Opibus. Um, we are today 130 employees, 100 person based in Nairobi, and uh, with a proud gender equality, almost reaching 50%. We are currently at 45% across the full management uh, engineers and, and technicians on the ground. So we are uh, Rome, and I insist on this logo, which is a new brand identity. We want to be modestly as known as Toyota and all these major brand developing petrol vehicles for decades now. And we think that um, Africa needs to be electrified through um, electric vehicles, as well as uh, any um, electricity uh, energy system and, and charging infrastructure. Please continue. Thank you. So this is a, one, of the, one of our factory, one of our assembly line. These pictures was taken uh, two days ago on uh, Monday, so sorry, yesterday on Monday. So this is our assembly line for our uh, estimated uh, in Rome Hair, which is our electric motorbike. Next one. And so we, we, we uh, I, will go, I will go roughly through our product catalog and what we do. Um, this is a few pictures. We, I think we, we all like pictures sometimes more than words and more than my voice even. Um, we do uh, electric conversion. So one of our niche and market is a conversion of electric, uh, the conversion of uh, long cruisers uh, into 100% electric. This is addressed for the safari market uh, and the mining market that we can find in East Africa. So this is not a product that we focus on um, uh, anymore. I mean, 100%, but we still convert electric, uh, we, we still convert long cruisers. And we also um, develop um, electric buses. This is one of the one of the first buses that we have uh, received on the ground. We uh, assemble locally a drivetrain, and we build the the the, the top uh, locally in in Kenya. And uh, without to mention that we've been all very proud to be um, one of the two African company um, hundred most influenced company uh, with Twiga Food. Uh, last year, or earlier this last year, actually. Please, next. So one of our two flagship products uh, we're very proud to launch this year, actually, after 300 prototypes on the road, is our Rome Hair. It's uh, an electric motorbike designed for the African market. Uh, locally, it's a 150cc equivalent motorbike, but 
we all like to say that it's a lot more powerful than 150 cc and we uh, beat on the road uh, the petrol vehicle with a pure electric uh, motorbike so this is a hundred person design uh, locally and um, we develop this new chassis to accommodate two batteries so one battery can have the range of 100 kilometer and two batteries the range of 200 kilometers maximum okay next so we, we currently have 35 percent of local content which is mainly um, all electrical wires the frames uh, which is locally um, assembled painted coated and 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 formed uh, we aim by next year, late next year, to reach 65% of local content. Um, of course, the question of what is percentage of local content can be a question I would be happy to, to, to answer uh, more in detail this question, but it's basically based on the value and weight of what we put in this, uh, in this vehicle. We, of course, uh, have the firm intention to be as close as 100% uh, moving forward. Please, next. Um, same for uh, same approach with our new line of vehicle, um, Rome uh, Move, which is an electric buses. So less uh, local content for this vehicle, but nevertheless, we're going to locally assemble all the electric drivetrain, um, and we're going to build locally all the all the all the top parts, so including seats and windows and uh, driving uh, driver uh, cockpit and uh, so on. Now, um, it's a rapid introduction to my level of uh, interaction uh, with this company. So we are an energy and charging company. We try to link the dot with our electric vehicle. And as I'm a very bad mechanic engineer, but uh, 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 trained as an electric engineer, I had to, the chance to take the lead on this, uh, different, um, th these different uh, activities. So we uh, do uh, solar and battery energy system distribution and installation. Uh, installation mostly for camps and off-grid area. We also develop, uh, starting this year, December, motorbike charging station uh, with our partner Total Energy uh, in Kenya to support the, the, the motorbike uh, that we're going to put on the road um, and we already have on the road. And we, we also install and, 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 and develop a charging station for our buses. Next. So now a, a little bit of focus on, uh, I, I hope not to confuse anyone with this uh, new world very similar to, Zoo, uh, to, 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 to the previous company we talked about. We talked now about Zurura, uh, which means uh, mobile in Swahili. So same roots, same foundation, same willingness to design and build things locally with a local name as well. Um, and um, this is, uh, well, yeah, from an experience with containerized solution for off-grid projects, we decided to redo uh, uh, a new new product uh, which is mainly focused on battery storage of course we can integrate uh, solar capacity but dura is mainly a battery storage container so we address this product to medium to large scale battery storage i would say anything above 300 kilowatt hour please uh, next thank you so what do we do um, from our experience and knowledge with battery system from the cells to the BMS and to, um, to the assembly of this technology, as opposed to importing already made uh, lithium batteries, we assemble completely our um, storage. So uh, what you can see from the left to the right, uh, we, we buy directly uh, in China um, these type of battery cells, which is 100% of battery storage, no electronic. We, together with BMSC's battery management system, we design battery module and we assemble them in a very modular and scalable way uh, up until the, the delivery of a project. Um, you can see here a project which was delivered last week actually in the Masai Mara, uh, 100 kilowatt uh, of peak power capacity and 320 uh, kilowatt hour of battery storage um, that we can store in one container. So we think that this approach as opposed to developing and buying container from abroad, is to give a very modular and very tailored uh, product where we can integrate different sources of energy, we can integrate different types of loads, and we can customize um, the, the product to fit exactly the need of the, of the customer, partner, or solar company buying this uh, product from us. Next. 
So when I was asking my, myself the question and with a few uh, colleagues of mine, um, is it more challenging to make product in Africa than anywhere else? My opinion would be no. Of course, the product uh, count, um, if we were manufacturing batteries, I would say it would be extremely challenging. Uh, this is why we assemble only batteries. Um, nevertheless, I, I don't want to speak too much about supply chain and volatility of the price of products, which we all have the, the same problem. I'm sure that our colleagues from France and, uh, and Europe and, 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 and all the continent have the same uh, issues with supply chain. We do uh, have, uh, we, we do put more focus on, on delivering products. And in that way, we ensure that our products meet a um, certain timeline in order to go to market extremely rapidly. So we do a lot of concession on, on, on some features that we would like to see on the first vehicle and that we will postpone on the second vehicle. That would be one. Of course, uh, the, the working capital and access to, um, to fund and finance is a very crucial point for an automotive manufacturer. And the way we solve the issue you know, instead of working, instead of raising a lot of uh, equity that will cover all our working capital expenditure, we actually sign a lot of sales agreement and letter of intent with all our future partner across the, the continent. And with this letter of intent and with this sales agreement, we can raise debt as opposed to equity that give us more flexibility um, and give us instant access to capital for the manufacturing. I will uh, finalize with a, a very important uh, last point uh, as, a, as a local uh, manufacturer. We know that things happen. We know that we're not perfect. The first product will not work as we want and we don't um, minimize the, the, the after sales. So we employ after sales people even before engineers. We wanna make sure that when things happen, bad things happen, we have the people on the ground. We have people ready to solve any issue and to keep the brand great and to keep to ensure that people still believe and trust the brand as we continue to improve the, the, the product. And finally, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we, we are the same as uh, so our uh, ambition as Rome, we're going to be exclusively in Kenya for 2023. Only from 2024 onward, we're looking at partners, distributor and reseller all across Africa. We don't know exactly which country we're going to be in, but we take any partnership uh, IDs um, on the link uh, Rom Motors partnerships. Thank you very much. Sorry for the wrong uh, start. And, 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 and thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, Roman, thank you so much. Um, can I ask all of our speakers just to be ready for us? We, we, we're running short on time and we'd like to at least bring one question to each speaker. So, Lord, I'm going to come to you first, Lord. Um, so, two questions for you. Um, there was a question about battery technology that you're using. And secondly, the technology that you've innovated, are you looking at other applications? So, battery technology and other applications, Lord. Thank you, Gareth. So, uh, uh, the kind of battery we use is the lithium-ion battery. Uh, we have uh, been trying to test a locally repurposed battery. So unfortunately that didn't work out very well for us. So now we're getting our batteries from China, uh, but it's a lithium ion battery. In terms of other applications, we see uh, the scale of our product. So we are able to use it for other purposes uh, on large scale. So it can be used for off-grid um, activities such as um, in, we're looking at the Mara, for example. So restaurants and, not, and campsites that are off-grid can actually use this application and can, can keep their food warm uh, in, the, in, the, in the bush there. We can have events companies uh, applying this uh, for their work. So the, we, the application for this product is, is endless. Yeah, thank you. Mm, very good, thank you. Nora, I come to you. Um, I think we're all amazed at the amazing things that you are doing. Um, so can you tell us about your, your marketing? There's a question coming in about your marketing. Where, where do you have presence? And secondly, there seems to be quite a lot of people listening in who, who have health products or are in the space, but are, they're not solar specialists. You are solar specialists. So um, do you see easy... Uh, co collaboration with other in the medical sphere to bring in your solar solutions. So if you could answer those two questions for us, Nora. 
Thanks, Gareth. So we mostly have marketed on social media and such kind of forums uh, because we know that those who pay for our solutions actually do have access to this kind of forums and probably they have the ears on the ground. So if it's the WHO, the UNICEF, uh, there's somebody on social media or someone in these forums or presenting at a forum will hear about our product and probably um, reach out to us. But we do welcome any strategies for marketing because uh, it's very, very, very clear for us, like our the need is even greater beyond Kenya and we've only focused on marketing within Kenya. And um, when it comes to other healthcare technologies, ever since we started manufacturing vaccine box and also putting it out in the field, it's come out very apparent that healthcare doesn't stand on its own, like just as cold storage. There are already um, peripheral needs. So there's data monitoring, there's IoT mm. solutions for monitoring, there's AI solution. For, for predictive maintenance and we're always looking out for what could actually uh, be accompanied with Vaxibox so that we actually achieve uh, a solid after sales support or we're able to monitor remotely and do troubleshooting. So we are always open to other solutions that are out there that still equally contribute to better healthcare within the continent. So anybody who has the solution can only just reach out to us and we see ways of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Arne, I, I come to you now. Uh, a question coming in regarding the comp, com, how, how to remain competitive with imported products. Um, obviously, the, the big focus on trying to be as local as, as possible. Sometimes the technology is not here. So how do you address that, remaining competitive when there's so many imported products coming into Africa? Uh, you're, you're on mute there. Thank you. Thank you. I think if we compare a product with the uh, same quality, we don't have a uh, expensive cost if we manufacture in uh, Africa. Uh, the main uh, problem with the, the, the cost of the product is uh, due to the transportation, the freight cost, uh, to uh, mainly on the sales of the product because uh, to import, we can uh, use some uh, international rules of, uh, of, uh, of custom that uh, if we transport all the components of a product in the same uh, boxes, we can do uh, the HS code of this product. So uh, for sub-Saharan uh, countries, we have the same exoneration as solar product. It is not the case on the beginning. We are taxes, uh, taxing tax on the component and uh, other company who import uh, solar products uh, ev every finish don't pay these taxes. So now it's okay, but we have a lot of costs, as I say, on the, on the sales. So uh, it's why we want to uh, implement some uh, uh, workshop in uh, each, uh, uh, country where we want to sell, it's the best way to have the, the, the good price. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Romain, um, we've obviously got lots of questions because there's lots of interest in e-mobility around the world. Uh, we won't get to all of them, but uh, Romain, you can maybe assist us with uh, just a few of them. So um, you mentioned a little bit about sort of retrofitting or transforming fossil fuel motors to Electric engines, can you just clarify that? Um, and also, there's a lot of talk in the in the space about the hydrogen cars. Is, have you looked into that? Um, because it seems like the e-mobility space is evolving quite quickly. So can you give us a little insight into your own R&D and whether it is retrofit to a standard car? Wonderful. Um, so to, to clarify, we, we for the motorbike, we started with a conversion of a Bajaj, very present in, in Africa a vehicle. And we don't do that anymore because we finally developed a chassis that is certified and that we put off. So we will only exclusively sell um, off the shelf uh, motorbike uh, with our own chassis and no retrofit, as opposed to the Land Cruiser with a high value of chassis and a high availability of the of the vehicle on the continent, we do believe that there is still a, a chance for us to convert this um, the, this uh, vehicle that will last for another 20 years, most probably, and we, we convert them. So this is for the clarification conversion versus a uh, new vehicle. Um, we sell motorbike and we convert a uh, light vehicle, and we hope to convert more vehicle in the future as well, um, taxi vehicle and lighter vehicle for the city uh, demand. 
Um, the, the, the second question regarding the hydrogen, indeed, um, hydrogen is a very interesting domain. We do think that Africa will have a beautiful uh, avenue as uh, developing hydrogen solution. We also think that right now, if we want to tackle carbon emissions now, if we want to do a big change now for every drivers, every electric vehicle owners uh, that pay the consequences of very, very high price of petrol, we do think that the best chance to tackle these problems now is with electric vehicle, with battery, uh, chemical battery storage as opposed to hydrogen storage. But we hope that uh, for trucks and vessels and uh, very heavy vehicle, hydrogen could be a solution in the next decades. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we obviously have a lot more questions and we will be um, posting them to the speakers um, because we're coming to an end. I do have, there is one question for me, which I'd like to um, answer about the containerized 45 kilowatt mini grid solution I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we've been designing and developing this. It is a, a modular system. So it is, you can, it's a plug and play in terms of adding quite, a, quite unique in the three phase um, uh, abilities and that the phases don't need to be balanced. So in terms of upgrading the system, it's, it's simple. You can add more per phase. You can add more modules in. And um, currently we have projects in most of the SADC regions. Our first project was a 90 kilowatt in Zimbabwe. We've done projects in Namibia and uh, Zambia. So we are commercially ready to take the product to the entire continent. I think from a from a purely from a manufacturer's point of view, I think um, our challenge really is to find technically capable people on the continent, I think is, is, is a vital aspect. There's many entrepreneurs and, and business owners who are keen to grow and expand, but to have the technicalities to be able to, 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 to manufacture, to, to install and, and problem solve is so important. Of course, we do all that training in house, but I think today we've met some amazing people and we've got some wonderful people joining us on this, on this webinar. Who possibly could do that so i think i think for all of us as five speakers i think we're telling everyone we're open for business and that africa has the ability to manufacture and lead the way we've got the best solar resource in the world we are uh, living we are living proof that it is it is we are capable of designing and developing and keeping it in-house of keeping the wealth in the continent as well so we have a lot to offer um, on the continent, and I think that the the, the speakers today re-emphasise that, and, and, I, and I would encourage those listening in, and thank you for your questions to engage. I see lots of LinkedIn requests, and, and, and we hope to see a lot more engagement from this, but the message is clear. Africa is manufacturing. We are open for business, and we can do it here on the continent. John, um, I hope that Yes, thank you so much, Gareth. Uh, I mean, you've said it all. Um, we, we had indeed an amazing lineup today. Uh, great people, great ideas, uh, and, and great energy. Um, it's, it was really inspiring. Even uh, for me, I've been in the field for so many years, and yet every time I am impressed by how creative and original people manage to, to be every time. Uh, and I'm really, really super thankful that you all agreed to be part of this webinar today. Um, before I let everybody go, um, I'd like to, to share very, very quickly uh, about some uh, future events uh, of ours. First of all, a, uh, a pure social event. If you have planned to be in Kigali, uh, on the 19th of October for the Gogla Annual Forum, which is a really big event taking place in Kigali this year. Well, we will be happy to welcome you at our networking cocktail reception, uh, which will be happening at the uh, Ono Motel. It's, uh, it will be in the evening. There will be lots of people to meet. There will be some companies presenting as well, some startups that we love to support. Um, and so really, really, if uh, you're around, it will be a great pleasure to welcome you there and to uh, catch up with you. Um, and then a little bit later in the month of October, we'll be organizing a new webinar, a completely different topic, yet uh, equally exciting. Uh, we will be talking about floating solar, specifically in Africa. 
Uh, and there's a lot of floating solar activity, especially in Asia and other parts of the world. Um, but there is a massively untapped opportunity uh, in Africa as well. And we will be discussing this opportunity with some of the leaders in the field. Um, a very, very forward looking uh, discussion on uh, what might be the next exciting topic of solar in Africa. This is it for today. Um, so once again, thank you so much uh, to you, Gareth, for accepting the invitation to, to moderate. You've done an amazing job. Uh, thanks to our speakers as well to, to accept the invitation and to, to take some time off your uh, busy schedules. Uh, and finally, also a big thanks to, to all the listeners. Um, I know we're all super busy doing our job, running our companies, um, and I, I just simply find it always amazing that uh, many of you managed to, to make some time available to, to listen to our stories and uh, share our passion about solar in Africa. Um, thank you, everybody, and I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.